Final Fantasy series is a gaming franchise that's loved and adored by millions of gamers worldwide. I would consider myself one of them, although my opinions do differ from title to title. One point of contention I've noticed within the Final Fantasy fandom seems to be which one is the best. It would appear that most fans enjoy Final Fantasy VII and Final Fantasy III the most, with the former being held in seemingly such a high regard that it's pretty much impossible for any of the Final Fantasy games afterwards to really live up to that standard. This is why my personal favorite Final Fantasy game, Final Fantasy VIII, seems to be passed over so much. And it's rather unfortunate because this is actually a very, a very good game. In fact, I would actually say I think it's one of the best psychological horror games I have ever played. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're, you're thinking, Final Fantasy is a fantasy RPG. It is not a horror game. And you would be correct because Final Fantasy VIII is a fantasy game. But it's not a happy, cartoony fantasy game, no. Rather, it's a dark fantasy game. Now, for those of you who have already heard the Skull is Dead theory, you probably already understand where I'm going with this. And for those of you who hadn't heard of it, please approach this with an open mind. Just let me lay out the evidence that has been collected first, and if that doesn't change your mind, that's fine. We are all entitled to our own opinions. I choose to accept this theory because it enhances my experience while playing this game. It also gives many lines of dialogue that would normally just be overlooked. Lines of dialogue way more weight and meaning. And in the end, I feel games are art. I know a lot of people do not believe that, but I personally do. And so to me, this game, it's like a painting. And when you look at a painting, your opinion of it and my opinion of it will probably be completely different. And that's okay, because we are all people and we can all look at something and interpret it and see it to be different. And now, one last thing, before we get on with this, I want to say there has been an interview with one of the creators of the game that people claim has debunked this theory. Go back and read the transcript for that interview. Because although at one point, yes, he does say no, that's not true. In the exact same interview, in the exact same question, he also then turns around and says, if we remake Final Fantasy VIII, maybe I'll make it that way because that would be very interesting. The guy was obviously trolling us. All right? You don't believe me? Go read the transcript. So, with all that being said, let's get on with the video. What happens to us when we die? No, I don't mean where do we go. I mean, what physically happens to us when we die? It is a rather scary thought, so you'd be forgiven if you've never even looked into it before. The important fact for the purposes of this video is that when you're close to death, your brain actually releases a chemical into you called DMT. This is the exact same chemical that is released into your body when you dream. This drug can be found in all living mammals. It's not a drug that was made in response to an evolutionary process or a need to survive, unfortunately, no. Or rather, it's a coping mechanism. It is the body's natural response to levels of fear that are so overwhelming that your mind simply cannot comprehend it. Have you ever had a dream that felt like it lasted for years? Have you ever woken up in the morning, hit the snooze button, and then had a full and complete separate dream after falling back asleep? 
and it felt like it was just as long as the dream you just had? I know I have. Well, that's DMT. That's the effect DMT has on your mind. Lifetimes can be lived in mere minutes under the effects of DMT, which brings up a whole plethora of other existential questions that we don't really want to get into right now, but maybe someday I'll do a video on the game Soma and we can ask those questions then. For now, all you need to know is DMT will cause you to dream. While you're knocking on death's door, you dream. You dream everything is great. You dream everything will be fine. You dream you had a beautiful life. You dream that you made a difference. You dream. But life doesn't always end on a happy note. Things don't always end up being tied together in a nice little bow. And sometimes, we just die. This theory really begins at the end of Disc 1. The battle between Squall and Adenia ends, with the sorceress hurling a shard of ice at Squall that goes clear through his chest and out the other side. Now, naysayers of this theory, they say, oh, it's fine, it just went through his shoulder. But look at this, like, that is not a scratch. That is way worse than a scratch. And if that wasn't bad enough, right after this, he falls off of the stage. And that is a minimum of a 20 foot drop, minimum. And because it's all covered in this weird fog, we don't really know exactly how far he actually fell but we do know it was a minimum of 20 feet if you fall from the third story of a building just the third story there is a very good chance that you're gonna die in fact there's more of a chance that you will be dead after that than there is for you to actually survive that but people want us to believe that Squall got this thing pierced through his body and then fell that far and he survived and he didn't even have a scratch on him he was good like why would you think that well most people you know they're like oh well you know when you battle you get hurt all the time you get scars and all that and by the end of the battle they're gone but they're missing one important thing that important thing is that in this game the only injuries that are canon are from the film sequences everything else is just gameplay and, and you might be thinking well why do you think that you know, why do you think that those are the only things that are canon those are the only injuries that are canon let me explain that to you i understand your logic here but i feel you guys aren't picking up on this the fact is that Squall and Cypher, they both have permanent scars on their faces. Not only do they have scars, but it is shown to us in the very beginning in the game that they fought and they gave each other those scars. Now why is this important, you might say? Well, it's because the developers are clearly trying to show us that in this world, if you cut someone, that cut was real. They wanted you to know that you can't just heal away scars in this world. Surely an injury as great as the one that Squall received, it, it, would, it would have left at least a scar. Best case scenario, if he survives this, best case scenario, he has brain damage for the rest of his life. That's the best case scenario here. You know, but again, the naysayers, they want to be like, oh, well, Altamisha, you know, she she wanted to heal Squall for interrogation purposes. Why? Squall almost killed Edenia, Altamisha. Almost killed her. Why would she want to heal him for information? He has been a seed member for two weeks. Two weeks. If she's going to interview any one of them, any one of this little assassination squad, right, that Seed sent after Ultimatia, they should be interrogating Quintus, okay? She has been a Seed member for three years and has been teaching Seeds for two years. 
and then again naysayers about oh well how's ultimate is supposed to know that oh i don't know maybe it's because cypher her bodyguard and squall's fucking rival would have known hey you, you don't need to give a fuck about squall he's been doing this i beat his ass he's been doing this for fucking two two weeks he's been a seed member for two weeks he's a cadet so again why there's really no point for her to even interrogate Squall. He would not be any more privy to sensitive information than anybody else in the entire squad. So, like I said, she should be interrogating Quintus. So, where am I going with this? This is where I'm going with this. I believe that this game begins and ends in that moment. And remember when I was telling you about DMT earlier in the video, it's because I was preparing you for this moment. When he gets hit and he's falling, he's dying. And this entire game happens before he hits the ground. And I do mean the entire game. Most people, when they talk about this theory, they like to say, well, no, the dream part didn't start until the second disc. I believe that we are actually seeing the story through Squall's point of view. And what we are seeing is his dream and in his dream he relives his death but of course because it's his dream it's his fantasy it starts and it goes further it goes past the point of death because he has regrets lingering regrets and he wants to actually be able to see the life that he could have had you know what would i have become so in that moment of fear before he hits the ground he gets the dmt injected into his body from his brain and he just hallucinates all of this shit he hallucinates the entire game now final fantasy 8 starts out innocent enough it begins just like any other final fantasy game you have your typical storytelling tropes the hero has his call to action he trains for the battles to come and he fights a fellow student who becomes his rival pretty standard fare so far. You play the game for a few hours, you kill random enemies, training, going through your first few dungeons and boss battles. It isn't until about the halfway mark that things really start becoming a little strange. And by that I mean the halfway mark in the first disc. You see, in most stories like this one, there's usually like the typical love interest for the main character, right? We've all seen it countless times, you know, in action movies, but not this time. This time, it, it's a little bit different. You see, the love interest in this game, Ernoa, initially, she wants nothing to do with Squall. And instead, she's all over his rival, Cypher. This girl is, like, all about Cypher. You know, it tells the members, you know, of the group how she thinks she's in love with Cypher and that they have all these fond memories so I mean clearly this just wasn't some kind of little crush obviously there was something there which is not good for Squall at all because you know this is supposed to be the kind of story where he gets the girl you know he saves the day and all that stuff but that's not what's happening and right after she tells everybody that Squall starts this strange inner monologue after she tells everyone how much she loves Cypher and he just begins wondering to himself like you know, is this how they're gonna talk about me when I die you know then he literally starts to freak out you know saying shit like no I'm not gonna let everybody talk about me in the past tense you know and this whole conversation is going on when they think Cypher had been executed because he had actually gone up against, he, he tried to assassinate the president of one of the countries out there. And a lot of people say, oh no, this is foreshadowing, this isn't really part of the dream that's going on, but personally, I think it is. And I think the reason why he freaks out and starts literally yelling at his friends and shit, and Selfie's over there being like, you're fucking mad, dude. Like, what are you doing? Why are you freaking out about being referred to in the past tense? It makes no fucking sense. I think it's because what's really going on is somehow, he, he, like, his consciousness is being able to realize, okay, this isn't real, 
and, and basically it, it's breaking like his, his mind mentally and that is why he's saying that I don't think it's I don't think it's foreshadowing or anything like that I think that was a moment where he basically almost woke up you know and realized that hey I'm gonna die an important thing to notice about the beginning of the game is it starts out relatively tame and what I mean by that is Final Fantasy has always been known to have a lot of fantastical elements in it but in this game in particular in the beginning of it it's pretty conservative there really isn't a whole bunch of crazy fantasy stuff going on you know it, it's pretty it's pretty grounded in reality yeah you have the GFs you do but nothing compared to the point after Squall dies it, it just starts to turns into a whole fucking carnival of crazy shit you know I mean they go to fucking outer space guys all of a sudden they go to fucking outer space like that shit doesn't even make any sense the garden starts floating which is the whole area where the seeds are trained you know animals start talking you know and they start making deals with aliens there's these red lion freaking pokemon things running through running around following you trying to talk to you it, it and the most importantly after that point where you think he's dead or you know well, i'm proposing that he died all of a sudden renona's all over squall like she doesn't care about cypher anymore now all of a sudden she's just like oh i love squall i want to be with squall you know squall protect me blah 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 and that's exactly how it would be if he had a good life and that's exactly how it would be if he was the savior. A lot of people say that this game is supposed to be about fate. I don't think that at all. I think what this game really is, is it's somebody who's basically having an ego trip. You know, he wants to get the girl. He wants to save the world. You know, he wants to beat the big bad. But he fails. And then as he's dying... He basically, you know, has a dream about the life that he could have led. And and that's what this really is. So the next thing I want to talk about is when Squall wakes up, even he's like, my wound? You know, last thing I remember is getting hit. My wound? No wound? What? And then it is just completely dropped. It's never mentioned again. It's not mentioned by Squall. It's not mentioned by any of the people in the party. It's never mentioned in a cutscene, obviously, because they didn't do voice acting in the cutscenes. But yeah, nobody ever brings it up again. It just becomes a dropped plot point. Which is weird because in the beginning of the game, like I was saying, like they made this big deal to show you that when you get hit by a sword, you're going to have a scar. So it just it just really doesn't add up. I don't know. Maybe maybe it's just that I hope this is true because I really like this game. And if this isn't true, then the plot just makes absolutely no sense. No sense at all. As I mean after this, right, like he ends up time traveling. Yes, he even time travels back to the past. And it turns out every single person from Seed lived in the exact same orphanage. And it's just like, come on, dude. Every single person lived in Seed? I remember when the game came out, people were bitching about that. They're like, how is this even possible? And I agree with them on there. But it can be possible if the dream theory is true. If this is all a fantasy then it makes sense that this can be true so all i'm really trying to get across to you guys here is that like there's just too much crazy shit going on for it to not be a dream and if it isn't a dream then unfortunately i have to i have to give up throwing the towel because then that means one of the games i love just absolutely doesn't make any sense which it probably does but i personally think that the whole squall is dead theory is probably true so let's get to the best piece of evidence which is actually the last cutscene and i'm gonna i'm gonna stop it every once in a while to point some stuff out 
and I want to show it to you guys. So, uh, thank you. Let's get into that. So, this right here. I believe this is purgatory. This is pretty much after he died. Now his body is in purgatory. So, that's why he's looking around. You know, he has no clue what the hell is going on. Neither do we. Because it's just really really strange there was no indication that some shit like this was gonna happen at the end of the game and it's just kind of like a weird random cutscene but let's let's keep going though now earlier in the game scroll actually learned how to dance from Brianna um, she was looking for cypher but he wasn't there so that's why she actually danced with him that's like the only good memory that squall has of her and in a moment here, we're going to see that memory. I'm just letting you guys know so it's not confusing to you. I just want to make sure you know that the important thing is to know that it is the only good memory that Skull has with her. And this here, this is why I think this is purgatory. Because he, he's been walking for hours and hours. He never gets thirsty. You know, like he's not hungry and shit. But he turns around, he looks at everything. And next thing you know, he's just on this little rock. Now the next thing I want to point out is uh, Renoa here. So what I think she represents is actually she is supposed to be basically his guardian angel who's here to take him away to the afterlife and uh, I think he's just projecting her image onto the angel as opposed to it actually being Rihanna and uh, so yeah. Notice this feather, it's the same one that was in the beginning of the game. And when he grabbed it, that's when you saw Rihanna. And what's gonna happen again, there she is, see that? That's why I think she's supposed to represent the angel. Here we go. You see how her face is all blurry? I think this is Squall's final moments. And the reason her face is getting so blurry is because he cannot remember her anymore. You see that creepy thing going on there? It's because it's basically a representation of, look, this isn't real. And he's clinging on to life now at this point. And look, she's gone. She's not even there anymore. He can't even remember her face. It's because the DMT is running out. See that? Now she's just turned into a creature of light. Or an angel. See that with the wings? You know, he's having flashed to the life that he could have lived. But didn't you see? You saw that right there? The flash of her with Cypher. That's who she ends up with. That's who Rio actually ends up with. And he's struggling now. And he's struggling bad. Like he cannot hold on to his consciousness for much longer. And he, he's trying, but he just can't do it. It's just getting worse and worse. He's desperately desperately trying to remember his friend now. There it is, and he finally accepts it. He dies. And the series finally lives up to its namesake of Final Fantasy. And that is Squall's Final Fantasy. <laughs>